Well, uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, this is welcome to our uh, thank you for joining us for the Southworth Golf Professional Virtual Roundtable. Uh, my name is Robert Bloomer. I'm the head golf professional at Creighton Farms. On the top of your screen, you'll start seeing some of our other professionals uh, from our other clubs, sister clubs. Uh, I'll start introducing them in order. Uh, so we first have uh, Erica Larkin. She's the director of instruction uh, at my home club, Creighton Farms. She's joining us today. Uh, as well as Mike Fidal, he's the director of golf at Willowbend. Mike, raise your hand. Uh, Rhett Bishop, head of golf professional at Renaissance. How are you, everyone? Just north, just north of Boston there. Uh, and then Brian Shaver, who has the best backdrop of us all, even though it's sort of fake. Uh, Brian's at the Avenue <laughs> Club at Winding. Welcome, Brian. Uh, and last Thank but you. not least, uh, the guy that I have to look at every single day. Uh, our membership director at uh, Creighton Farms, Larry Spielberg. Welcome. Thanks for uh, thanks for joining us, everyone. Um, for this for this uh, roundtable, we'll spend the next forty five minutes to an hour just discussing certain topics around the golf world, uh, ranging from the Masters in November to uh, Bryson DeChambeau and the power effect versus accuracy that he has. Uh, so we'll go through multiple different different topics and also answer some of your questions that you have presented to us prior to this meeting uh, and also ones that you have uh, currently. Uh, if you do have any questions from now on, please go ahead and just type them into the chat and then they'll pop up on our screen and I can go ahead and bring you into the conversation, uh, answer those questions and uh, come up with an answer for you, hopefully from our expertise, if we have any. Um, this Zoom conference is being recorded, so if, if anybody has not joined us yet or is joining us in late, um, we will be able to send this out to our memberships after um, to be able to review this again if you'd like to. Um, and welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us. Uh, let's go ahead and start talking about the first topic on our list here. Let's talk about how the PGA tournaments have changed this year, COVID-19. Um, I know we have seen it in all of our operations. I know we have seen it all in all of our operations here at our, at our clubs. Um, you know, for instance, our men's club championship, or women's club championship was last week, and uh, it's a little, little bit different. But um, let's go and start talking about how the PGA Tour has, has handled those tournaments, uh, what you see in the future. How many, uh, if we were going to allow fans in 2021, depending on how COVID, uh, COVID starts uh, digressing a little bit. So I'll, well, let me turn this over to Rhett. Uh, Rhett, if you want to chime in for a little bit and just talk to us about how, uh, how the PGA Tour has handled this situation, what your input is on, on the amount of uh, lack of fans, I should say, and you know, how, how the golf courses look different. So give me, give me your input on that. Yeah, I mean, um, to be honest, when it comes to sports in general, what we're dealing with right now, I think golf, I mean, it at least feels the most normal. Um, I, obviously, we, we're used to seeing fans. and um, But, I mean, you, you get like a basketball and hockey, you know, it really looks weird. Whereas golf, I mean, we're all used to playing golf. And, you know, obviously, we, we never have crowds around us. Um, these guys are used to it. But, I mean, watching it on TV, I mean, you don't really – I mean, it's not crazy different. I don't know. Do you guys agree? Obviously, we're used to seeing fans. But, I mean, uh, when it comes to a sport that, you know, can happen, you know, on the most normal basis, uh, you know, I don't know. I just – when I watch it, I can't really even tell. Obviously, we're used to a lot of fans. And, you know, I just one, – one of my points to make is that I am always interested in the, the guys that, like, you know, when they're in the hunt and – you know, they really feel the pressure. I'm always interested to see if, you know, they'll get over the hump of uh, winning because there's no fans. And, I mean, this year, surprisingly, you know, you know, you look at, like, a Ricky Fowler. Like, I mean, he's won, but, you know, you can see he feels the pressure on Saturdays, like, especially. I mean, he mm -hmm. has bad Saturdays. He starts out good, and then, um, and then he kind of falls off on Saturday, especially then he'll have a good Sunday. But, I mean, I – I was interested to see if, you know, maybe he, 
he came out and won, and he hasn't been doing great. Um, but I mean, that so was do you, one thing. So, Red, do you think it's me. so, Red? Do you think it's less pressure or more pressure having fans? If if they see the fans you know, and they I, feel well, like that's the thing. I mean, in their I, in their own zone, right? Sure, and, and that's the thing. I mean, I thought it would feel maybe less pressure, but you know, these guys feed off it a little bit. I mean, they, they feed off the, the people around them and maybe they feel a little pressure, but um, I think the fans kind of amp them up. You saw, you heard a lot of guys saying that at the PJ championship, like they miss the fans cause it amps them up. I mean, it's, um, it's more of that than, than anything for them. Like when they're coming down the stretch, they kind of feel the juices and, and um, you know, and, and that, that gets them going and, and kind of uh, amps them up, just like any sport, obviously. Yeah, well, and you you look at you look at what is it, sixteen at the waste management out in Arizona. Yeah, was, you know, yeah. you look at the start of the Ryder Cups when they're on the first tee of the Ryder Cups, and it was a few years ago when Bubba Watson was just getting the whole crowd revved up right before bringing I mean, everybody up. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's you know, they thrive off it just like a lot of people do in sports, and unfortunately, I don't foresee golf going uh, in the direction that you now see basketball or hockey where they fill the stadium with screens and put fans watching it on there. Um, you know, I think that might yeah. be a little tough yeah. on the golf course and might have a few broken <laughs> TVs, but um, I really think that some people really are going to feed off of it. And like, they're not being fans and they're really going to enjoy the quiet and the, so the ability to focus. But I think other people are going to hurt from it because they do exactly what Red said. They completely feed off of, the energy that the crowd and the fans provide them, you know, when they hit a great yeah, shot. Certainly, yeah, certainly great. I think, I think if we can bring this into maybe the uh, corn Ferry tour and Brian's experience with those guys, how those guys, I, th I think on a week to week basis, especially, you know, Africa club, they don't have as many fans on course. Um, and then you look at these college sure. kids coming up, you look like a Matthew Wolf who, doesn't have as many fans on the golf course while they're playing. I think they're coming into the 2020, 2021 seasons and not having fans. I think they feel more comfortable that way and they can dip their toes in. Like Brian, do you, have you had conversations with any of those guys down there about obviously not this year, but you know, in the past and their type of uh, experience about fans or no fans, if they feel comfortable, uncomfortable, if they like fans, don't like fans, what are your, what are your comments? Well, my experience is, is dealing with really the, our past winner was Rafa Campos. He loves the attention. He loves to be around people. Um, he likes, he likes that, you know, that vibe that he gets, he feeds off that energy. So um, really from all the other guys, I mean, it's, it's, it, it's a positive to have people around, but you know, during the corn fairy tours, there's not very many people around. So, but with Rafa, yeah, it was, it was definitely a positive. So do you think, do you think guys that are coming off the corn Ferry tour here in the next year? So even, so let's backtrack a little bit. All the PGA tour players this year still are able to keep their card for 2020, 2021 season. They're not cutting anybody after the top 20, 125. Um, but any guys that come off the corn Ferry tour, do you think they're going to like, you know, maybe it's their first time being on the PGA Tour. They're going to feel more comfortable because they've already been around events that are lack of fans. Yeah, I think they'll, they'll definitely feel a lot more comfortable. I mean, it's there's a lot more pressure. You know, if you have more experience, money's not an issue. Traveling and covering your expenses are not an issue. So you're going to be able to relax more on the golf course versus a guy just out of college trying to make a living, trying to cover their expenses. So that's – that's pretty much it on that. And I mean, you know, you look at, you look at the PGA championship and, you know, they, you could see a lot of the guys feeling the pressure without the fans. And that's, that was kind of, obviously it's a major championship and everybody's trying to win, but that was a little bit more surprising to me. I thought people would be a little bit, um, you know, they'd kind of ease up a little bit, but you saw them all struggle. And that was, you know, to be honest, it's fun to watch. I like seeing the tour players struggle because, then when you're struggling or, you know, or, you know, the members that we have, they kind of, you know, they struggle in a day and it's, it's nice to see the tour pros get in rough and hit it five yards. Like, you know, I saw John Rahm hit it, you know, 10 yards out of the rough. That's how thick it was, mm -hmm. you know, so it was just, uh, you know, it was, it was interesting because, you know, they still, 
felt a lot of pressure and um you know that was it, it was cool to watch and and uh yeah a lot of got a lot of young guys in the hunt which was cool yeah i think that's uh that's a good segue over to our next our next topic here not necessarily talking about the pga championship but uh discussing talk, uh talking about the winner or of our of our pga championship uh colin markawa let's let's talk about him for a little bit and how you know he's come out of cal uh he's won three times on tour this year already has won over six million dollars um as a 23 year old i think we would all kind of want that too right um let's talk about him for a bit and how his his kind of uh demeanor his professionalism, his demeanor uh, kind of helped him through winning over that hump of that first major, especially with no fans, um, you know, and the lack of probably pressure that he didn't have to feel with not having fans. I think two of his three wins, he won a Memorial, uh, won a PGA Championship without fans. And it's just something where he just goes out with his caddy and just plays his own game. Uh, and doesn't worry about the pressure of, you know, signing autographs after play or doing any of that kind of stuff. So let's talk about Colin. Let's talk about how he, uh, let's talk about his future. Let's, let's uh, kind of get input here. Um, Mike, what do you, uh, I think you're on mute there, Mike. Maybe. There we go. Yeah, Mike. That's, that's why you didn't hear me when I tried chiming in before. Let's talk about. You froze on my screen, Robert. All right, what are your what are your thoughts on Colin? Talk to his uh, his future. You know, I think he's got a really bright future, and just to see him back. Of, what's that? Can you hear me? Go ahead. Okay, um, I think he's got a really bright future. Um, I do agree a lot with what you're saying, and the fact that you know he's kind of newer on tour and he's won a couple of times without fans. Um, I guess I would really, how far exactly is he going to go? Um, you know, it'd be interesting to see how he could do that with a, a normal crowd. Um, but just the fact that he was, he was in the situation he was and the shot, the tee shot on what, 16 was it? The par four? Yeah. Was, I mean, I don't care if there's not a single hey, person. Drive golf. I mean, if, for anybody to be able to take the risk when you're in that position in a tournament and to do that is just, you know, it, it, it's very risky and to do it and feel comfortable enough with it, pull it off is just, it, I think it speaks a lot for his nerves. Um, he almost has kind of a gunslinger, I guess you might want to say, like he's not afraid to just do, go for something as opposed to, you know, a smart shot would have been to lay up. Um, so I think he's going to be a very, very fun player to watch for hopefully a very long time. But I still would like to see, even on a like a Sunday at Augusta with you know, put Sunday at Augusta with him and Tiger together and see how he can, he can just handle the Tiger aura next to him and see if he can do that do what he just did. But what he did was remarkable and he deserves all the credit. Um, I actually just handed off my men's member member championship trophies the other day and I made sure that they held the tops down real tight. <laughs> but um, yeah, was fun. He, he's going to be fun and you know what i think he's a name that we're going to be hearing a lot of in the next next hopefully 10 to 15 years oh 100 percent. i mean he's missed one one cut and he's won three times the whole time he's been out there so he's obviously we have i i think uh i think that Colin and, and some of these young guys coming up have a nice advantage because if they came straight out of college, the current kind of vibe at a tournament is probably a lot like what they felt in a college setting. You know, yeah. I mean, some cameras, maybe like at an NCAA championship, like minimal camera, you know, some camera coverage, people mulling around, family and like media people. And that's kind of like what it is right now. So, I mean, for them, they might actually kind of have an advantage that that's a a uh, typical scenario so it might throw off a guy like a Phil Mickelson or whoever has you know more seniority mm -hmm. on tour because they're so used to the energy where he doesn't know what he's really missing so it could work against him when the fans come back but I think in the meantime somebody like Colin you know it's working in his favorite favor and 
young guy once he's got nothing to lose and um there's you know no no distractions i mean i have to believe that at every tour event too these guys get pulled in so many directions with fan events and and other you know sponsor events and parties early in the week and and pro-ams like i don't even know if all that stuff's happening i would think not so um that helps them all concentrate i'd have to believe and it doesn't distract them away from their prep for the week so that's that's got to be an advantage for a guy like Colin. Sure. Yeah, I mean that's it. You know what? Um, they are doing the pro amps because I was watching it today. They're, are they? We have an event in uh, at TPC Boston in Norton, Massachusetts, and they were they do uh, they sometimes do some like little games and they play like two two on two matches. They were playing Wolf today, but um, I just kind of saw it uh, on TV earlier. But um, yeah, I mean that's a good point. And you know what? I I it's crazy. These college kids, they come out so strong. I feel like, like a Matthew Wolf, Colin Morikawa, Victor Hovland, um, John Rahm, you know, all those guys. Cause I, they're literally tour pros before they're even tour pros. I mean, in college they're yeah, they have fitness coach, you know, nutritionist, um, you know, swing coach, mental coach when they're in college. So, I mean, when they get out, and they've won so many times in college. So, and it's, you know, they're playing against the same guys when they come out, they've played with them, you know, a few years before, and then you throw in the older guys, but I mean, they, they walk on tour, like they, like they should be there. And, and that's what's, that's what I feel like is different um, lately, you know, cause I've, I realized it first with like a, a ROM, like, I mean, the Jordan Spieth, you know, he was just on fire. Like he, in that, he kind of petered out a little bit. But, um, but like John Rahm, I mean, he literally, he walked on tour like he had been there for five years. You know, um, so it's. And I, I think they really, yeah, they really are strong when they come out of college. You know, I think right, that, I think uh, that 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 goes towards. Go ahead, Larry. No, I was I was just going to say that I think one of the things. You're seeing some of the guys who are winning, like Colin and um, Holman, who just won. The one thing that they have not uh, had the uh, impact on yet is playing with the gallery, which is always moving. You know, when they're, um, you know, when they're playing behind Tiger or they're playing behind Phil, yeah. they're playing behind one of these guys, and that in itself is going to aid them right now. Mm -hmm. And to be able to, yes, like Eric said, they're feeling much more comfortable because it is much more like a college event. But once you get that, and there's a lot of commotion going on, you know, like Tiger always says, he doesn't even feel it. He doesn't even see it because he's almost in a trance. But these guys, that's going to be the interesting part to see once you do get fans back, how they handle those situations. Because I think that's where it's not so much the pressure but it is so much the managing of how you have to play the game then. Mm -hmm. Larry, that's a, that's a good point, Larry. And I think that kind of segues into our next topic, talking about the mental game is how these young guys, how these older guys, you know, uh, go through their mental aspects pre, you know, pre round, post round, during the round, pre shot routines, things like that. Um, you know, obviously we have our own, all of our own individual, you know, pre-shot routines or what we think of on the golf course, uh, what we think of during our swing or lack of what we think of during our swing. Uh, Larry, let me bring this back to you and talk to about, <laughs> Mike's shaking his head, talk to you about uh, your kind of mental aspect. I know you're a big pre-shot routine guy, um, you know, with these guys not having anybody on, on on the course you know obviously they can stay in their own zone and uh, when they do have people back obviously it's going to change but the importance of a mental game the importance of you know the six inches between your ears uh being 90 percent of the game larry talk to me about kind of uh i'm, I'm afraid to ask this talk to me about your mental game. <laughs> yeah i'm not sure you want to go there but now i think that the uh, the biggest thing uh, that happens is that uh, and it's when everybody when you're playing well you know everything's going great everything's wonderful 
But then when things start to go bad, everything gets in fast motion. Everything is just going so quickly, you're making bad decisions. Um, and I always go back to a, uh, like Michael Jordan standing on the free throw line. He does the exact same thing every time. He bounces the ball twice, he spins the ball, and then he takes a shot. And what all of that is doing, it's not necessarily trying to get him ready for the game, for the shot. It's getting him in that the mind where his mind gets cleared and he's able to perform the shot. He's not thinking of mechanics. He's thinking, you know, he has his um, trigger that he is going to use. And I think that's one of the biggest things that people going from the range to to play golf is they've got to have that pre-shot routine so that once they get into the shot box, they're not thinking about their golf swing. They're thinking about execution of the shot, where their ball, you know, the smallest target, where it's going to go. So um, that's one of the biggest things I think that can help any amateur golfer is having a routine because that keeps them in the moment and uh, in the best possible way. Larry, isn't it like, um, if I'm not mistaken, some of the best ball strikers on tour, if you take a stopwatch and you start it the second they address the ball to the moment they hit the ball, they're going to be within a tenth of a second every single time. No question. There is also, there are some golf coaches now, or actually within the last 10 or 15 years at colleges, that that's what they work on. They work on, they, they don't want any of that deviation, you know, where you get over a tee shot and it's taking you 25 seconds to hit the shot. And then you get over, a, you know, a iron shot and it's taking you 35 seconds. This is not what they're trying to do. So they're trying to get everything. So every shot is, you know, you're, you're going to execute it in the same manner. So you are right. I mean, those guys, you can pretty much put them on a graph and it's a flat line. That's the the guys who are you know playing very well, Eric. Yeah, I, do you, go ahead, Eric. I was just gonna say, Eric, do you agree with that? Yeah, I think that um, they all have a very predictable process. And Annika was on the clock, I think, fourteen seconds or something. She had like they always you know talk about um, her as an example of of a, of an, a legendary player that had a very 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 consistent routine. Um, and so being process oriented versus results oriented is kind of a good mindset to have so that you are focused on if I do these things, you know, in this way, I follow this routine, literally, that you can um, then rely on that process to produce results as opposed to trying to, you know, wish the ball or steer the ball and that kind of thing. But I mean, that's great on paper. In reality, I, I feel like on the lesson T, what I try to get people to do is it's okay to have a swing thought. I think people think they have to play golf and they're supposed to like make their mind go blank. A lot of good players have a swing thought. It's okay. It might be an alignment cue. It might be something in the backswing. It might be something with a, with, with a body part or the way something feels through impact. Like they all do, you'll notice they do rehearsals. And they do exaggerated rehearsals. A lot of these guys at high levels, you know, you see it. They, Justin Rose is famous for that. A lot of these guys do these little mimic moves that they're trying to feel in their swing to um, counteract whatever their tendency and their misses. So it's okay to have that too, but you have to, you know, one, commit to the decision of the shot you're trying to, to hit and then the club selection. So I'm going to hit a seven iron with a draw this far. I've already done the calculations on wind, elevation, blah, 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 right? You make your decision. And then when you come in to take that practice swing or you're trying to connect with the visualization of your shot, you're seeing and kind of feeling everything as one package. So you, you commit to the decision you wanna, you, wanna, you wanna do, you see and feel the shot, you rehearse it, and then you do it on the ball. Like there's that, moment where you are experiencing or um living you know sort of the shot in your mind's eye in your practice swing and then you get up and you do it i mean i think you see that with a lot of good players and amateurs just they don't internalize what it is that they want to experience on the ball they're sort of thinking consciously about it and not feeling it so 
I mean, I'm all for having one or two simple swing thoughts or alignment cues. I think that's totally fine um, because, you know, chances are we all have things we want to improve on. And so it's hard to get to a point where it's totally unconscious. Uh, so I don't think there's anything wrong with that, but you have to wrap it up in a feel and then put it on the ball without too much hesitation. That's my, my two cents on that. You know, and I think you said one thing there that I was uh, that that really resonates is the commit. You have to and having the swing thought. There's nothing wrong with that, but you have to commit to the shot, and that's Jason, where people Day, have to learn how to do that. Yeah, Jason Day does that perfectly. I mean, he he visually. I mean, you see him on on TV just visually close his eyes and pre and and visualize the shot as he before he before he steps into it. Um, I think that's one guy that you can you can look upon and just if you uh, you know can just visualize in your head before you even step into your shot what kind of shot you want to hit. Hopefully it turns out that way. Um, you know he's a guy that you can replicate from. But if you don't um, if you don't visualize it to start with, then you're already at a disadvantage. I think that's where people miss yeah. it. They just they take for granted that part of the routine. And that's one of the most powerful parts. If you don't have a clear picture of what you're trying to do, you're not giving your brain proper directions and you don't have that level of commitment. I mean, so you, I think that's so essential. So I have two things to say here. First of all, something that I heard said that I will never forget was said by that guy over Larry's left shoulder. Um, when we did the, uh, official grand opening of Creighton Farms and somebody asked Jack what is going through your head when you're over any shot it's a tee shot on par five anything he goes it doesn't matter where I'm at on the golf course I'm trying to do one thing and that's make the ball in the hole every single shot so I just I, that's sunk in with me and I'm like wow he's like really obviously he knows on a 550 yard par five he's not going to make it but that's his mentality of trying to just get it in the hole but um, so I thought that was really cool but Larry, you mentioned it earlier, and Eric, I really would love to get your input on a trigger. I love to try and teach my, um, teach my people, you know, try and yeah. get a consistent pre-shot routine. And for me personally, you know, my, my trigger is my right thumb doesn't touch my grip until I'm ready to swing. That's my little trigger. When my right thumb touches, I swing. What is your thoughts, Eric, on a trigger to start the swing? Uh, yeah, I think that uh, waggles are great. I think that, you know, people definitely kind of settle into their shot with grip in different ways. Some people have a little bit of a forward press and then they pull back. I think that there has to be, you can't start from zero and then like just initiate motion without some move to get things started so that you can be a little less tension uh, bound, you know? So I think there's, it's healthy to have a little bit of, of movement in the feet or movement in the hands and the wrist to kind of start the club swinging back. So I don't think it's a one size fits all. I think you have to play with what you feel um, works for you. So I think that what you're doing sounds great. I, some people <laughs> prefer to hover the club. Some people prefer to kind of like, once they set the club on the ground, then that's like their take back move. Other people, it's that little forward press. For some people, it's a move like into their left foot and then their right foot, you know, lead foot, trail foot. So it could be footwork, it could be hands. I've seen head movements trigger golf swings. I mean, it's a, a million things. So I don't think it's one one thing, definitely not. I, I just, uh, I'll chime well, in with uh, the trigger a little, uh, a little go bit. Go ahead, go ahead, Rhett. Uh, I just think if you look at Jordan Spieth, I mean, when he was playing his best, he had that little trigger before he before he hit with it you know, when his in his full swing and his putting, and I feel like he kind of lost that a little bit when he was trying to tweak his swing. And um, you know, obviously you look at like a Matthew Wolf, he's got a funky trigger, but you yes. know, uh, it's something that works. And you know, um, I know I do it on the putting. Like putting is probably my best part, the best part of my game, and I do the same thing every time. I mean, I drag my putter back, lift my hands. You know, it's consistent every time. And I really, I should blend it more into my full swing. Maybe it would work. But um, no, i huge believer in pre-shot routine and uh, keeping it consistent. And um, yeah, that was awesome to hear Erica talk about it. Well, Rhett, you bring up a, you bring up a good player, someone that's, um, 
been to Creighton before, and uh, we have a member here, Mr. Perkins, asked, uh, please, please explain how and why uh, Jordan Spieth has gone so far off the rails. Uh, you know, he's, you know, a few years, a few years ago, he was, you know, winning, winning almost every tournament, uh, you know, on top of the leaderboard, almost every event, uh, you know, top 10 within every single category, especially strokes gain putting. Uh, anybody have any, any insights uh, uh, into why do you think Jordan Spieth is, has kind of gone off? I think for me personally, it's probably obviously off the tee. He's just not getting himself into the proper position uh, off the tee to then therefore attack attack the whole occasions. Um, I think he's he's constantly been fighting that his entire career. He he honed it in for a couple of years there, won uh, obviously a bunch of events, a couple of majors um, at a young age. But now he's now he's trying to fight that back. Um, where do you guys? I, I mean, in your game getting the rails whenever you guys play uh what are some things you think that could help Spieth kind of get it back on track here didn't didn't Jordan uh try to make a swing change isn't that what kind of keyed everything because he felt he wasn't hitting the ball as well as he needed to and then that just kind of infected his entire game because now he wasn't making the putts that uh, you know he yeah. was before because he was putting so much pressure on him. But am I am I correct in saying that he uh, he was making a swing change? Yeah, I think he was trying to get more. Yeah, I think I think from what I hear, um, and then he kind of was trying to tweak his swing. But you know, he's always been that. Like I mean, even when he was winning, um, you know, he was always you know kind of always talking to his caddy and, and, and I mean, even when he won, it wasn't like, a pre it wasn't pretty. Um, he'd hit it in the rough and he was like, he was like top, uh, top on the tour out of the rough, you know? Um, cause he had that little chicken wing follow through and kept the club face real square. I mean, I don't know. It's, you know, his putting saved him a short game. I think it was just, you know, overall everything, um, you know, little by little, he was, I, I've heard he was chasing distance. Um, why? You know, I don't think he was that, sh I mean, shorter, but not crazy short. Um, but that's what I heard a little bit. And I think it kind of, you know, then it came from, you know, it came into changing his swing and, you know, tweaking things. And then he's just, it just seems like he's getting a little in his own way. Yeah. You know, if I'm correct, he's had the same swing coach forever, right? Yeah, McCormick. Yeah. Yeah. Erica, what's your thought on that? Or do you think it's – there's only so much somebody can learn from somebody and they – not saying leave somebody else, but maybe go get some help from somebody else. What's your thought on that? I'd love to know that. Yeah, I mean, look at Tiger. And then, of course, he goes searching for – to be perfect a little bit more this way, that way, get somebody's opinion. And before you know it, they start making changes. I mean, he was – what was he searching for? He was at the top of the world there in, you know, the early 2000s. And then, and then what? Um, I don't know. I mean, I think Jordan, he got married. Um, not to say, you know, that that's a good <laughs> excuse, but honestly, like, you know, you grow up. He was really young and hot young. And so things change in life. There's stresses outside of golf. Uh, you have responsibilities. Uh, it, it things it, that's a long time girlfriend that you know he obviously married. So, uh, but just throwing it out there, like people go through shit in life, um, whether it's you know they have an ill child or they lose a father, and like you see ebbs and flows in their career, it comes out through the way they play. So, uh, it's it's a good thing he's you know married a wonderful gal there, but it's still something that is part of him being a human being and and changes that happen over the course of a career. I think he'll be back. I think that uh, it's not a, a long-term lull for him. Um, Cameron's a great coach and he let Jordan be Jordan. And so I think that, you know, sometimes when you do take that sort of young, just natural model and then you start tweaking and then again, it's that search for more, search for more, you, you can mess with a good thing in a way, but I think he'll be back and, I don't know his physical uh, health or anything either. And I only say that because the way his left side of the body breaks down through impact and he has that chicken wing. And then of course the left leg kind of bows out, like 
maybe there's more going on than we're aware of and you know it could catch up mm -hmm. with somebody at a certain point so I'm not trying to make an assumption, but I kind of always felt like there was more going on there in his body than maybe he has ever disclosed. Um, to, to function like that through impact, there has to be some mobility issues in my opinion. And so uh, who knows, maybe again, he's fighting stuff that we don't even know about, so. You, you heard it first here from Erica Larkin. Yeah, that's my, we'll that's my yeah. take we'll, that. we'll report it to TMZ. Yeah. <laughs> He's got an injury. <laughs> Erica, what do you do you um, think do you think he mentally thinks way too much over every shot and before I mean he just seems like he's always talking he's always like confused about what's going yeah. on. Do you think uh, that's a detriment to him? Sure, he's definitely jittery. I mean, you could definitely see him talk through everything with his caddy, but but then again, I mean, everything I know about the mental game and have read and researched and heard people talk about is some people do better when they're like that. That's just their vibe on the course. Other people are better when they're mellow. Some people are better when they're pumped up. Like, I think you have to kind of find your vibe. And for him, that did work for a while. So it's not a bad thing to be that way. If, if verbalizing what is going on in his mind to his caddy and talking it out actually helps him make a decision and and helps him feel good over the ball, then that's what you have to do. So I don't think that his style is bad. It worked for him, <laughs> you know, for quite a bit, quite a while. So, um, but you can definitely, you can uh, second guess yourself when you start losing and then that just creates doubt and that breeds more doubt. And before you know it, it's like you're off the wagon. So like like again like a tiger i mean not that he, he made, made quite a comeback here but um I, jordan's young he'll be back i it's just people go through stuff that's it'll be nice to get him back because he, yeah. was such a, he was such a draw you know to so many people loved watching him and sort of rooting for him and then he just kind of fell off but i mean yeah we talked a lot earlier about the the young guys like the morikawa and all that stuff but i did i think that there's a there's, there's such a tight age group of those guys right there that the golf is it's in a beautiful spot right now. That's going to be great. Well, yeah. I mean, if you think about it, I mean, speed's only fallen off for you know, maybe, maybe two years, year and a half. I mean, um, and Erica made a good point. I mean, he has always been like that mentally. He's always been, you know, talking to his caddy and then he'll screw up a hole, but then he'll birdie the next two. So I think he'll, you know, he's just got to, get the confidence back and and he'll be good well, but it'll be fun to well, see him come let's chat about a guy that i think is is uh on golf channel a lot on the on the leaderboards a lot that he obviously is a very mental person talks a lot about or thinks a lot about uh you know ball speed club head speed distance uh you know always looks at his green book 50 times while he's on the green uh i think everyone knows his name let's talk about bryson uh, Bryson DeChambeau and his talk about how his his weight gain, his strength gain has has affected his game um, prior to getting on this call. The guys posted a, a stat about Bryson and uh, his strokes gain off the tee. He's done COVID season. And his total value is basically double what Roy McIlroy's uh, stroke gain, uh, stroke gain off the tee is. And you think about Roy. Roy's probably one of the top five guys in the world over the last five six years. That's off off the tee. He's very consistent. Obviously, he's extremely long. But then you look at Bryson, who's put on all this weight, all this muscle, ball speed, carry distance, everything. How do you see the PGA Tour and all the other tours after that? going and even in the women's game uh of, of distance off the tee do the usga and the rna have to have to bring back the golf ball um in order to kind of keep everyone together or is bryson and a couple of these guys just trying to gain so much distance off the tee that eventually course courses are going to have to grow grow up the rough and make it even harder for these guys that are just kind of bomb and gouge um Larry, let me toss over to you, and then Brian, just have you chime in for a little bit about uh, about kind of the distance off the tee and what you guys think. Well, you know, I think with Bryson, um, you know, he is a very uh, clinical, very technical type person, and he, you know, I'm sure, went through all of his uh, 
due diligence on what he was he felt he could do to improve his game. The amazing thing to me is he's gotten better in every category uh, as far as accuracy and distance. Personally, I don't think that this, I think this is kind of a, a two-year type of situation. I don't think his body is going to um, be able to last doing all of this. I think that if you watch how he's rolling on his ankles, how he's you know, coming through impact, I think it's something that's going to take a toll on his body. But it is a game that uh, you got to make it when you can. And people, you know, nowadays they can set themselves up financially, you know, in two seasons, in one season. Uh, But I think that, you know, there is, I think all of this is going to go through cycles. And I think that, uh, you know, you you start building golf courses to counteract this, uh, you know, the guy who's hitting the ball that far. And I think it's going to take away from everything else. Um, you know, let's get back to, you know, you could even get back to some of these, uh, you know, the way it used to be where there 7,000 yards was about the longest, you know, you had. And that, that now you're getting into U.S. Open type conditions. But um, I just think with Bryson, he is – He's found a way that works for him because it's very technical, but I think this is a very short-lived type thing with him. Uh, someone like Rory McIlroy, who has created all that speed, uh, that in itself will also take a toll. Now, I think that's what Eric was saying, that Tiger rebuilt his swing two, three, four times, and he did it because of what was going through with his body. And you've got to try to create that swing that will match with his body. Um, and I think that that's, that's what Bryson's doing right now. He's young enough. He can handle that extra weight and that extra muscle. Do you think he's headed down the same road as Tiger in regards to, we all know that, I mean, in the book, it said that Tiger was training to be, a, he wanted to be a Navy SEAL. And so he was training with those guys. And that's when he got so big and bulky and eventually ended up, you know, really hurting himself. Do you think he's potentially heading down that road in a few years? Obviously, he's not nearly as old as Tiger was at that point, but. I think it's a different, I think it's a different uh, effect on his body than what Tiger did. Um, You know, Tiger's knee, that was the beginning of it. I mean, Tiger put so much torque on his left knee uh, Mm -hmm. coming through impact. I mean, he would snap that left leg, which would create all that speed. And that put uh, a lot of the, uh, uh, the problems, that started it, which then leads to the back issues and leads to the other things. I think, you know, Bryson, it's, it's a little bit different. Uh, you know, Tiger was a smaller guy. Even when he was at his biggest, he really wasn't a big guy. I mean, he's maybe six foot. He had a, a, just a tiny waist. I remember w- uh, one of the U.S. Opens, I was walking behind him, maybe about 10 feet behind him. And you know, his torso was not very big. And then you get down to his waist, it was small. And then all of a sudden you get to his butt. He had this huge butt and his legs were huge. You know, I mean, it was like his base was unbelievable. And that's where, you know, that was a little bit different than, uh, you know, with Bryson. I think, I mean, you look how violent Bryson goes through impact. It's like, how does he even make, you know, make contact? And then how does he keep it as straight as he does? And, but, Again, I think some of that, that does have to do with technology because our drivers are designed now to go straight. They are not designed like I see a Mr. Sherwood over there. And, uh, you know, back in the day when we had the bulge and roll on the, uh, you know, uh, persimmon woods, I mean, everything was curving, but now the ball is designed to go straight. So, you know, it kind of plays into his technology that he's going through i don't know about you guys but i think it's i think it's really fun to watch him uh tee off with a driver yeah Yeah. you know like he he literally it's like a long drive championship he gets like pumped up swings as hard as he can like five times and then he gets into the ball and then rips it you know but he's you know i've seen instagram videos of him training you know through all this covid i mean he you know, he puts a lot of work into it. And that's the thing. I mean, if he sees that he's going to get hurt, I think he'll just tweak it again. He'll do something different because he's always pushing it to the limit. I mean, you know, 
he was messing around with side saddle and then they banned it and he got all pissed and you know he's always just trying to find the new the new thing and obviously it's clearly working for him i mean um you know the one length clubs now this you know putting on 50 pounds i mean if you look at his you know what he's doing to some golf courses i mean it's you got to give him credit i mean he works hard at it and he's smart and um you know, man, if he gets his wedges dialed, and you know, I, it was interesting. Someone was, I don't know which commentator was saying, I think it might have been Faldo, but he said, you know, why is he using the wedges at the same length as all of his other clubs? They thought, you know, he might be able to, you know, get him a little bit closer if he cut him down to normal length, because um, th that's the area that he struggles with a little bit. I mean, he's still, still good. He's still a pro, uh, but you know, if he gets those dialed in, it's, it's deadly for sure. Well, you got uh, the news today that, you know, uh, um, you know, you had uh, guys back out uh, yeah, Kepka. because of injury. You know, you got Kip Brooks Kepka back out because of injury. And you look at that guy, you know, the last couple of years trying to gain distance, gain muscle, gain speed. His knee, his knee goes out. Uh, now it's a back issue, which once you have one issue, all the issues kind of come after that. You know, I think it's just a, a matter of time with Bryson. And, you know, Larry makes a good point. It's, you know, these guys are going out to make as much money, I think, as possible is what they can do now and, and, and see what, what happens in the future and if they have to change they have to change I wouldn't be surprised with Bryson's mentality if he drops 30 pounds over the over the winter and goes back down to a different body uh, to find a little bit more control or be able to protect his body um, and you know I don't know if the distance overall it depends what happens over the next couple of years obviously what happens on, on tour what distance is but I think there was a stat that came out when Colin won the PGA championship, he was, I think, 90th in the field and, and distance off the tee, and he was hitting at 298 exactly. yards. I mean, you know, 90th, 90th in the field out of 150 guys, and you won the tournament, right? That, that's just accuracy. Um, so that's a good point. Um, Brian, I'll bring you into this a little bit here. What are, your, what are your thoughts about, you know, distance off the tee? I know you're the long ball out of all of us here. Yeah, right. Well, you know, I've been teaching for quite a while and been in the golf business for a bit. Um, and I think everyone's trying to get more distance. So, you know, why do we want to restrict the ball? And everybody's just, you know, amazed by distance. But, you know, when, you, when it comes down to getting your body all bulked up, I mean, a perfect example, if everybody knows, Keith Clearwater. He was on the PGA Tour. He was on the regular tour. He got – he was real skinny. And then he got really – I mean, he was ripped. He got bulked up. And then now you don't, you don't even hear his name anymore. He's basically – he's on the senior tour sometimes. You see him at the bottom of the list and as far as scores. But, I mean, he just got so bulked up and muscly and, uh, you know, just got rid of a lot of his, his agility and, 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 and touch and feel in the game. And, and that's what – I, you, know, you see Bryson swing in the golf club, and, I mean, it looks like he didn't know where it's going. I mean, he's just out of control. But I think he needs to back off a little bit and get a little more, a little more control in his swing. So, as far as, you know, the body, I think, you know, I, I don't think it needs to get bulked up. But um, as we can see from other, other golfers that have gone through this. But the golf ball, I think we should keep it the same. And, make it fun for everyone, grow the game. I mean, part of growing the game is, is, is distant, what everybody's after. I agree. And I'll pass it on to Erica here. What are your, what are your thoughts, Erica, with what you're, what you're teaching on a day-to-day -day basis? And probably, I mean, the number one thing people come up to us is, especially in the women's game, is I want distance. How do I get yeah. distance? Well, uh, couple, what do you say to that? A couple of thoughts uh, before I address that too. I, I think, you know, in other sports, um, but I think of gymnastics or figure skating only because when you look back to say the 1970s, all they were doing in ice skating was like a one jump loop, right? Like a one, one twist in the air. Gymnastics, the same thing. And then 
you know, five, 10 years go by and that next generation of gymnasts or ice skaters, all of a sudden they were doing double flips. And now in this, the last Olympics, whenever it was, I think they were like doing the four quadruple axles, right? I mean, like you, that next generation of athletes is always going to push the envelope. And so Bryson's just a good example of, again, like Red said, I mean, a smart guy, kind of a nutty scientist, um, but you know, he obviously has a method to his madness and he's pushing that envelope. So this, I mean, it could be a new norm that these young guys that are so fit and so dialed in specifically with, with golf from a young age, with training the right way and eating the right way. And they're all growing up in the sport, very fine tuned to be optimized for golf. And now you know, he's going to push them as well as the next generation to come into the sport and like, why not hit it 400 off the tee? I mean, guys have been hitting it 330, 350, like 400 might be the new norm. And so whoever can do that and have control and there will be guys that can do that consistently. We just, it hasn't been the norm yet, but it doesn't mean that it won't be. I mean, if you ask somebody in 1975, if somebody could land quadruple axles on my skating rink, like consistently, they would say no way in hell. And now like it's happening, you know? So I just think that we're seeing the next era and it does depend on the, on the governing bodies of golf and what they allow, but I am all for it. I mean, I think that the farther these guys can hit it, they still have to get the ball in the hole. They still have to chip and putt. They're not going to drive every single green, right? I mean, there's still part long par fours. There's still par fives. And as long as they make these golf courses and as good as they make the equipment, you still have to get the ball in the hole. So maybe it becomes a putting contest. That's okay. Like, it's okay. I want to see that. I want to see everybody make eagle on every other hole. That'd be amazing. That'd be amazing. That'd be so fun to watch. So um, I'm all for it. And I think that from the lesson T question, I think that the average golfer is not going to go and bulk up. They just don't have the time or the resources to do it. The average club player. And that's fine. You know, we can let, let, let kind of minimally help people rehab injuries or gain mobility. Forget about like putting on muscle and legitimately gaining true you know strength and speed that's a whole project and there are committed players that I have that that do do the work and they do see see gains but that's a whole regimen of training plus technique so you're talking about swing changes and physical changes um, so unless you have the time and and both you know time resources and, and potentially mo monetary resources to dial in your body your equipment um in your golf game like that's a, is it your full-time job or are you just you know have the time to do this the average golfer the answer is no now the junior golfer coming up they have unlimited time you could say i mean they have years on their side to develop their bodies and then and get to that point but i think for the average club player it's more about can you hit the center of the club face can you consistently do that and present the club? We'll talk drivers here for a second, you know, with the right angle of attack. Is your equipment, does it make sense for you? And, you know, are you moving the club in your body in a way where your sequence is good? So you're maximizing your own best club head speed with your baseline body where you are today. From there, you want to take it to the next level. And these are the conversations that we need to have about how to do that. And this is what it's going to take. And are you willing to do that? So I think for the average player that I see, it's the, the gains, the easy gains are, you know, is your sequence good? Are you hitting the middle of the club face? And then, yeah, let's take a look at your equipment and make sure it fits you. If you can, you know, check those boxes, you're going to gain some yards. Uh, and so most people are, you know, happy with those gains because it usually is the difference of five, five miles per hour, 10 miles per hour, which is, as you probably all know, 10 yards, 20 yards. Um, and so that makes a lot of people fairly happy if they know that they can get that, but it still takes work. So there's no magic bullet. I agree with that. That's the thing. DeChambeau put in the work. He put in the time, you know, I mean, credit to him. He, you know, he worked, I mean, he built his own set of golf clubs in college. I mean, the guy's just, you know, he works hard. Um, yeah. 
And, and you know what? If you looked at, at the PGA, he didn't, you know, that green that Morikawa drove, he laid up on that most of the time. I mean, because he said, you know, fairways were a priority that week. Cause, you know, so he, he actually said he was, you know, he wasn't going as hard at his driver and he wasn't going for as many um, greens, trying to carry bunkers because he just didn't want to deal with hitting out of that rough. So, I mean, um, do you dial the golf ball back? I mean, that's a, that's a question you could, you know, you could just go on and on about that. But I mean, you still got to get it in the hole and, um, you know, he, if he hits it that far, cause he busted his ass all COVID worked hard, you know? So, Hey, if you want to put in that time and, and do that, like he obviously studied, you know, long drive guys and, he hits it pretty straight. I mean, he goes so hard at it, and he's pretty accurate, you know. He's got like a six-and-a-half-degree driver or something. Um, but, yeah, good for him. Hey. Well, that kind of brings us into one of our last topics here that we had is, is discussing, uh, I think, the, the best major that we, that we look forward to every single year. Unfortunately, it was postponed, but we're going to have two within, within – six months of each other, five months of each other. Uh, let's talk about the Masters. Let's talk about the what the Masters is going to look like. One, without fans. Two, with the fall colors. It's not in April anymore. It's in November. Uh, colder weather. How's the course going to play? Uh, does a guy like Bryson, who can bomb it everywhere without any fans, does that assist him? Um I think some of us who have been to Augusta before, I know, Rhett, you worked at the uh, at Berkman's Place, one of the biggest merchandising facility that they have there. Um, and a couple other of you have also gone to Augusta, um, one with fans, but it's just going to look so different without fans. I think if we look online and look at pictures of Augusta, it just looks 9 and 18 or, you know, right there close together. Um, it's going to look very different visually. How does that affect the players? Um, let's talk about the golf course. Let's talk about how it's going to uh, look, look like on TV. And let's talk about your pick. Let's go down to every one of our professionals and let me see who, uh, who your winner is for this year. Start with Mike. Oh, great. Um, actually, before I do that, what do you, th do you think the scores – I mean, I, I think the scores will be actually higher. Um, I sit back and I, I think about it was actually when our first topic of conversation we talked about with the whole golf without the fans is you sit back and you watch years past of golf and the player hits it offline, way offline. Well, there's a hundred fans over there that know exactly where his ball is. So they don't lose the ball. Or it well, hits a fan. <laughs> or he hits the fan and it bounces back in. <laughs> well, now we don't have any of those fans to help you out, give you a little foot wedge back into a good lie. Um, so I, I potentially, you know, I, I think the scores could be higher. Um, you know, I've winner wise, I could be, you know, I, I like tiger. Do you I go still, with the tiger? Do you go with the, do you go with like a, a Freddie couples? Do you go with a guy that, you know, is just, I just don't think Freddie's like back and hold up. I don't think Freddie's back and hold up. Like back well, and it's going to be, it's cold, colder weather, you know? Yep. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that I think the scores would be higher. I mean, um, blustery, you know, cooler conditions. It's obviously swirly, you know, um, it always is at Augusta. So I think that would be interesting. You know, the winds, the wind will be, you know, probably different directions than guys are used to. Um, I don't know how many of them really play in the fall. I mean, they, what do they shut? They shut the course down for, you know, all of the summer, I think they open it back up in like September, but I don't know how many guys go, go there, um, you know, in the fall to play. So it'd be interesting um, to see that. But I mean, in regards to the fans, I mean, I worked, yeah, I worked there for two years at Berkman's place. We, I was there for a week and, um, and we'd get to like cut out a little bit early from work and go watch the tournament. And both years I went were, the year Spieth won and the year Spieth blew it. And um, so that was crazy to me because I went, I got out of work at like three and I think he was on six 
Peaks, the downhill par three. And he was birdies that, birdies seven, birdies eight, birdies nine. I think he made four in a row. And he was up by, I don't know, three or four shots. And then I went back and I watched players on the back nine. And, um, and then all I hear, you know, there's manual scoreboard. So no one has a cell phone. They won't let you in there with a cell phone. Um, so they're manual scoreboard. So when they put it up, everybody's like, oh, you know, so they put his score up and everybody's talking, you know, you're, you're running around and I hear he makes a quadruple on 12. So I ran over there and, you know, I'm, I'm watching him play 13 and then, you know, Danny Willett is like no one around, you know, he's, there's like no fans around him because uh, no one was really watching him. But um, that's what, that's what's interesting about the Masters is the manual scoreboards and it's all about, you know, you would just talk to people and they knew what was going on by just talking. Whereas, you know, everybody knows you can just look at your cell phone and, you know, you can see Spieth made a quadruple on your, on your phone normally on any other tournament, but with that, no one knew. So it's all hearsay and, Oh, did he do that? Did he, did he not? You know? So, um, and it's just like, you know, there's the echoes and the, you know, in the trees and the valleys that, on that golf course is, uh, it's crazy. And it'll definitely, that'll be one that's uh, interesting without fans, just uh, from that perspective. I mean, if you've never been there, it's crazy. I mean, the 10th hole is so downhill. Um, you know, the greens are so undulating. So um, really cool place. But pick wise, uh, ooh, I don't know. I mean, a lot of good players. Uh, Ricky Fowler, I'll go with Ricky Fowler. I mean, I always like him in Augusta, so I think he'll win one of them eventually. All right, what about uh, what about you, Erica? Let's go over to you. Gosh, uh, so I've been to two Masters, and uh, I can only imagine how gorgeous it's going to be with all the fall foliage. So that'll be spectacular. I, you know, I. I to be there in person is so special, but I don't mind, you know, watching golf on TV and they've done such a good job over the years at broadcasting different parts of the course on their website. So I assume it's going to kind of be the same thing. So you should see a lot of coverage if you're, if you have the time to sit and, and watch it all, you know, you can click over to different groups and stuff. So hopefully they do the same and um, we'll be able to see a lot of the course and a lot of different groups in play. So I think it's going to be great. It's not going to be the same without fans. I agree with that, but um, I don't know. Pick wise, it's going to probably play firmer and faster than ever. Just being normally in the spring, they get some storms coming through and things like that, you know, so I feel like all that rain in the spring has got to soften the course a little bit, even though it's Augusta. So I would imagine it's going to be just super firm in the fall so it'll be very interesting to see that like how crazy those greens get with how undulating they are and we know how fast they are normally like what is it going to be like when they firm up even more with the cooler temperatures so i just i wonder about that uh i i think you know finau has been hot this year um he'd be cool to see he's been hovering around and he's had a couple nice mm -hmm. runs at augusta so i think he'd be kind of a good pick and I mean, I'd love to see Bryson do something crazy. He was up there a couple of years ago and blew it too. So, I don't know. We'll yeah. see. It'd be it's fun, amateur, It'd be fun right? to see. Yeah. I was an amateur, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that, yeah, I know. I was rooting for him that year. I think that was his rookie yeah, year. Was he was just – maybe he was just before he turned pro. I can't remember. But Yeah, it was. It was right before he turned pro. Yeah. I just remember he was wearing an Augusta – like he was wearing a, a master shirt. Yes. Yes, that's right. I think it was the year Speed one, or it was anyway. Maybe. Yeah, I was rooting for him, Joe. Yeah. Let's uh, let's let's go to Brian, and then we'll finish up with Larry. I know Larry's got the Masters music as his ringtone, so I hear it almost every day. Uh, Brian, who who's your pick, and then uh, we'll finish up with Larry here. Um, you know, being from the South, uh, knowing uh, you know my parents live in Georgia, so. I always try to try to fly home and play golf with my dad in Georgia in the fall. So that's pretty much the best time to play is, is fall and then second spring. Um, golf course conditions will be just optimal at that time. 
you probably won't see a lot of dye over the sprinkler heads if you're actually get to walk the course at that time um, due to the grass being green. Uh, sometimes you see that in, in the spring. Uh, my pick would be uh, Daniel Berger. He's been hot for a while. Golf Channel picked him. He was big on DraftKings. He won a lot of money. So uh, that would be a good bet if you're, if you're a, a gambling guy. I thought you were going to say Kevin Kisner because <laughs> he's a Georgia no, guy. That's what I thought. <laughs> <laughs> Daniel Berger lives next door to one of our members in Jupiter. So uh, Yeah, yeah, he, yeah. He's a Jupiter guy, yeah. Uh, we've been following him quite a bit lately. Uh, last thing is uh, Darren Clark. Just uh, he awesome. had a good round, a little quick five under. So he's on the leaderboard in the senior tour out in Missouri. So good luck right. to him. Awesome. Good job, Darren. Uh, Larry, let's finish up with you. What? Uh, who's your pick for the Masters? Um, what do you think, man? Well, uh, I was kind of you know. Same lines as Erica. Tony Finau was one that I thought really has a good chance to uh, get his first major there. I mean, he's uh, he's a good putter, and I think he's a good uh, he's a good driver of the golf ball. So, you know, he'll have uh, and he's as long. He's I mean, he's might not be as long as Bryson, but I mean, he's long, so he's a good one. I'm a huge Matthew Wolf fan. I just I love the guy's golf swing. I love Gankus, um, but he's no. not. My, but he's <laughs> but he's he's not my pick. I pick Victor Hovland. Ooh, good pick. I think I think Victor is uh, out of Victor all of them. <clears throat> he's a stud. He's a stud. The guy the guy has has got a lot going for him. I mean. Uh, He's got a lot of intestinal fortitude, and uh, uh, I'll have to look that up. I just I heard about that one time, but um, so Victor's Victor is my uh, pick for the Masters. I like Victor. Uh, to kind of round up group here, I, I'm just going to go Finau as well, as long as he doesn't uh, break his ankle in the par three contest. Yeah, you know, as long as he <laughs> doesn't run down the fairway after making an ace. And uh, hurt himself. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good pick. Fina's a good pick. He's been playing well. Be fun to watch, though. For sure. The best thing about it is you got the Masters in November, then you got it coming back in April. So five That's months true. later, and then the other. How about the guy who wins it? He gets to keep his jacket for five months. Hey, sorry about that. Uh, could you bring it back? Uh, you know, by the way, uh, the dinner's going to be. Uh, you better, you better pick your food pretty quick because we've got to get the chef to order the food now. They don't have to give back their jacket. Yeah, they keep the jacket for their life. They, uh, but they only get to keep the. Uh, they only get that title for five months. Yeah. True. True. Yeah. Now we'll see. Maybe it'll get pushed back to the same date. No, they'll never, you never know. <clears throat> never know. Where'd the host go? Yeah, it looks like our fearless. So he froze <laughs> up for a second, so I'm guessing he. Uh, yeah, he probably lost service. He's been kind of breaking up a little bit. Yeah, he has. But I know that uh, I know he was planning on um, calling it uh, calling it the end after that topic of conversation. Um, I do do believe I saw. I don't know if anybody replied. Um, there was one thing that popped up on will there even be a par three contest? Have you guys heard anything at the Masters? I mean, if they're all there, I mean, if they're all there, you would think they'd still have that. Yeah. I mean, um, but I don't know. I've I haven't heard anything. But I would say, I mean, they they're having like I said, um, they're having pro amps. I was just watching the one at TBC Boston. They were playing in shorts and they were playing like Wolf. Um, so I think they'll probably still have it. You would They're think not so. doing the uh, the women's event or the drive chip putt, are they? No, they canceled that. Yeah. yeah, I used to work at that too. But uh, yeah, we we held the uh, we held the like one of the drive chip and putts event events at Renaissance the past couple of years, and yeah, they yeah. canceled it. Unfortunately, that was pretty cool. Yeah, little kids putting on eighteen. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, 
next year. It's an interesting year. So. I wonder the kids that qualified this year for what would have been April if they get. Yeah, a... You would you would hope so, you know. Yeah. Um, but I mean, you look at you know look at the Boston Marathon. I mean, imagine those people. That like breaks my heart, you know. Um, raising that much money and then you can't, you know, it's just yeah. Um, so who knows? I mean, they might, but um, you would hope so. Maybe they get like pushed into the second <laughs> round or the second. No, yeah, they'll extend it another year. Yeah, but then some kids probably age out. So you know, yeah, I'll be interested so many... to see what they do. Yeah. Hey, Robert. All right, sorry, I got uh, I got disconnected there for a second, uh, so I'm I'm back now, but. I think that was kind of the end of our discussion there with the masters and how we were going to finish up our, our round table here. Um, I'll just want to say thank you. Thank you. And, and Greg for joining us. Uh, thanks to the marketing team for getting this uh, set up and for all the members that joined us this evening. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, you can certainly reach out to us. I think on our, on our, when we send this email out to our to the membership, we'll put all of our emails on there. So if you have any questions individually, any of our pros, uh, you can certainly just reach out to us and we'll get back to you uh, with any answers that you do have or any questions that you do have for us. Um, so once again, thanks guys. Appreciate it. I'll see two of you Thank tomorrow. You. Thank you all. Thank you. Hope to see you guys soon.